Hello and welcome to this tutorial for the Concrete Beam Design Spreadsheet to Eurocode 2. Um, in order to uh, get this spreadsheet you need to go to my website and click on the icon here for the Concrete Beam Design. Uh, currently we're looking at version 1.3 but if you're looking at this in the future this may have been updated. Uh, once you click on this it's going to download a zip folder. You're going to need to extract the zip folder and inside that zip folder is going to be an Excel file, a spreadsheet and also a PDF worked example. Uh, in this tutorial we're going to focus just on the spreadsheet itself um, but I recommend looking at the worked example as well to familiarize, to familiarize yourself with the, the calculation process. Okay, so jumping in, uh, this is what uh, appears when you first open the spreadsheet. You have this uh, sort of warning message here, this disclaimer, and this disclaimer is basically saying that you need to make sure that all the inputs and the outputs that you're dealing with in this spreadsheet, if you're using it for design, um, are correct and that you're, you're happy with how it's actually calculating. Um, it's your responsibility to make sure that you're using your own judgment and making sure that the actual outputs and everything are as you expect on the spreadsheet. Okay, so with that out of the way, we can jump in. Um, so when you first open it, you'll, be, you'll jump into the project info sheet, and this is where we can basically add all the project information. So I can give a project name, I can give a project number, for example, client, uh, all of this, I can fill all of this in. And then when I go to my design sheet at the bottom, down here, I can click on auto fill header information and it's going to drag all that data in into here. Okay, So that's how you deal with that. Um, we're now going to focus on the actual design sheet and, and how to deal with this because this is the main sheet of this spreadsheet and it's where all the design work is done for the concrete beam. Um, I should mention as well right off the bat that anything in a light yellow cell is, um, is an input. You can put input, you know, input data in and uh, anything with a different color to light yellow um, you shouldn't mess with. It's basically either a formula or a header that you shouldn't be messing around with. Okay, uh, and the idea is that on this on this sheet that every single header here is numbered, um, so you can go through in order to fill out all of the input data, and then go through in order and sort of check your design. Okay, so if we go to the first section, we have section one, and this is the analysis options, and this this panel here basically allows you to turn on or off different parts of the calculation, um, should you need to. So we can either include or omit our um, span over D deflection check. L is the span of the beam, and D is the depth of reinforcement. So it's the span over um, depth of reinforcement check. Um, we can turn that on or off our deflection check. We can also turn on or off our crack rip check for our bottom or top steel that we have. And we can also turn on or off our uh, bending shear and torsion checks, our deflection check, and our crack rip check for um, the reinforcement in the sides of the beam. And the reason we can turn off the bending shear and torsion checks for the reinforcement in the side of the beam is that oftentimes we don't have reinforcement in the sides of the beam. We only normally have that reinforcement if we're looking at minor axis bending, for example, or if we've got a deep enough beam where we need to add sidebars to deal with sort of cracking or any kind of issues like that, or if the cages are becoming so big that we need sidebars in order to allow the person on site to actually fix something to, to make the cages stable enough to pour concrete on. So you know, you might not actually need to use any of these at all. So for the time being, I'm going to omit all of these in here. I'm going to omit that. We're going to leave our, our uh, these ones on for our bottom and top steel. Okay. So that's how we deal with our analysis. We move on to the next section. We have the concrete properties. And these are the concrete properties at 28 days, which is when the concrete has reached its full strength in here. So these are the values we're using to design for our moments, our shear, all of the rest of that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, we can set our concrete grade, so we have a bunch of preset concrete grades, but you can also pick a manual one down the bottom, and if you click a manual one, you will see that it opens up this cell, and you can add in a custom uh, characteristic cylinder strength in here uh, if you want. I'm not going to do that, I'm going to stick with C2835 for the time being, and you can see that that's populated our cylinder strength, but also our mean compressive strength, our mean tensile strength, and our mean modulus elasticity. I should also mention that the mean modulus elasticity it's not just dependent on the concrete grade, but it's also dependent on the aggregate type as well. So at the moment you can see I've got limestone here. If I'd picked quartzite, you can see we've got a higher value for our mean modulus of elasticity. So, you know, this, this value is important when we're looking at our aggregate type. And the modulus of elasticity comes in when we're looking at our crack whip calculations, uh, and only the crack whip calculations, so it's important for those. I'm going to set this back to limestone. If you want more information on how this is calculated, you can look at the, uh, the notes in here. And in fact, there's notes here for every single section here, so you can have a bit more information as to how these are calculated. 
Um, and then finally in this section, we've got the maximum aggregate size. We're going to stick that as 20 mil. Um, and this basically um, allows you to sort of check how, but how far we can space our, our main reinforcing bars apart before we get problems. So it's a check on, on that for our detailing purposes. Okay, so that's our concrete properties. Next, we have our reinforcing steel properties. So we have our characteristic tensile strength and the modulus of elasticity. And these are the sort of default values uh, for the UK um, for high strength uh, tension reinforcement that we're using for re you know, in our concrete beam. So I wouldn't recommend changing these values. But um, there are some values in the Eurocode that you can look at if you've got sort of a different situation. But generally, these won't change from these values here. Next, we have our concrete beam geometry. So we have our beam depth, our width, and the beam span and the beam support conditions. The beam depth and the width, if I change these, it will update the diagram on the right hand side here. So I change that to 600 for my beam depth. You can see it auto updates to, uh, to show the geometry. Um, the beam span and the beam support conditions. These are only really used to, for your L over D deflection check. Um, and the simply this support condition case here um, changes the K factor when we're looking at our L over D check. And if you sort of hover over this, it will tell you what different K factors will be taken uh, for different support conditions. So that's what those are used for. Obviously, the, the beam depth and the beam width are used to work out um, the beam properties when we're looking at you know all of the other uh, checks for bending, shear, torsion, all the rest of it. Moving on, we have our concrete cover. So we have our concrete cover from the edge of the beam to the start of the reinforcement in the bottom top, side left and side right of the beam. And if I change these values, you will notice that the diagram on the right hand side also updates um, to reflect the cover. So you can see there, I've changed the bottom cover to 100 mil and it's moved up this reinforcement here to, to show that. I'm gonna put it back to 75 and you'll see it change on the top of the beam, for example. Um, these concrete covers you should um, you know, work out yourself using the guidance in the Eurocode. You know, depending on the situation you have, you may need more or less cover um, to protect the steel work. Moving on, we have crack width inputs. Um, this whole section here, in section six, this will all be grayed out if you've omitted the crack width calculations at the top here. I've obviously left them on at the moment, but um, that's just something to be aware of. So don't panic if this appears gray, you probably just turned off your crack width calculations entirely. Um, up here we have the allowable crack width. So this is the value we're sort of checking our beam against. Um, this value I've just put in point 0.3 because it's a sort of a typical value for a foundation, but sort of multiple different um, crack width values are given in the Eurocode for different situations. And particularly for water retaining structures, it will be much less than point 0.3. And you should look at um, Eurocode um, part 3 of, of the uh, concrete code for sort of more guidance on that. So that would be BSEN 1992 part 3 for the water retaining structures. Moving on, we have the type of rebar. Uh, and this basically affects the K1 factor when we're looking at crack widths. So at the moment we're going to stick with high one bars. We have the type of loading. Generally speaking, this is going to be uh, bending for our beam. I've allowed you to put, put pure tension as well, but typically this should just be bending. We have the number of days when considering short-term loading. So this sort of section here is to do with um, when we're looking at short-term and long-term loading of the concrete beam for the crack widths. The crack width checks look at short-term loading, which uses the concrete properties calculated based on the um, the time that you put in here. So this is sort of set at 28, but I can make this less than 28. So if I put 15 days in here, the spreadsheet will work out the concrete properties at 15 days, and it will use that to work out the crack width for the short-term loading. For the long-term loading, the concrete beam, the, the spreadsheet looks at the concrete properties at 28 days, so the full strength of the concrete, but then it also takes into account the, um, the creep, and the creep only affects the modulus of elasticity. So the creep factor only affects this value up here, the ECM value, the mean modulus of elasticity, and it reduces that when you're looking at long-term loading. And it does that based on this creep factor here, okay? Um, so you can imagine, at the moment I've got 29077, our long-term loading that accounts for creep would be this multiplied by one divided by one plus our creep factor. So one divided by one plus our creep factor is one over three, a third. So our long-term modulus elasticity would be a third of this value up here, okay? So that's what it's doing there. And then our S factor for cement type um, is also dealt with, it's also used to work out some of the concrete properties as well um, as part of uh, BSEN 1992 part one, okay? So that's what the crack are doing. Uh, next bit is our internal forces. So our internal forces here, we've got our bending moments applied to the bottoms of the beam 
bending moments in the top, so that would be our sagging moment, that's our hogging moment. Then we have the bending moments in the side left and the side right of the beam. We're going to leave these as zero because we're not dealing with the side reinforcement. Then we have our major axis shear, our minor axis shear, and our torsion that applies to the beam. So I'm just going to put in some values here to start off with. Let's put in 50 and 45 for that. Um, these values here, ULS stands for ultimate limit state, so that would be the failure conditions. So these would be factored loads, ultimate limit state. Um, these are you. These loads here are used to work out your um, your bending check, your L of a D deflection check, and also your uh, shear check on it, and, and the torsion check as well at the bottom of the spreadsheet. The SLS uh, forces in here, the SLS moments, those are used for your crack widths. Okay, so I need to put in something so we can work out our crack widths. Let's put in 25 and say 15 for that, and let's put in a shear force of 75 kilonewtons. Okay, so that's our forces dealt with. Uh, moving on, we have our reinforcement. Okay, so up here in section 8 and 8.1, we have our main reinforcing bars. So at the moment, you can see I've got 16s at uh, that's, well, six H16s. If we scroll down to our diagram, you can see we've got six H16s in the top and bottom of the, bottom of the beam. And if I added more, so I added 10, for example, in the bottom, the uh, diagram will be updated to reflect that. Let's put that back to six. And we can also put in our shear links here as well. So at the moment I've got um, H10 diameter for our links and they're spaced along the beam at 250 millimeters. So that's in and out of the page when looking at this cross section. And we've got the number of legs. So if I added more legs, you can see it's added more down here. Um, it makes you have a minimum of two legs because you need two legs at least in order to form this cage when they're on site uh, and putting together this reinforcing bars and everything. We're gonna put that back as four for the time being. And now that's sort of the end of all of the input data for this spreadsheet. Everything else now is just automatically calculated for you. So this next section we have the depth to the reinforcement. So the depth to the reinforcement from the top of the beam, from the bottom of the beam. So this the bottom here is the distance from the top of the beam down to the center line of this tensile, tensile reinforcement here, this red bar. And alternatively, the distance this D top value is the distance from the bottom of the beam to this top reinforcement up here. Okay, so that's what it's doing there. The next section is the geometric checks, and this basically checks to make sure that we have enough spacing between these main reinforcing bars in order to pour our concrete and get a, a vibrator in there and, and check the actual, you know, and actually vibrate the concrete and get everything, you know, properly detailed. Um, so that's just a check on sort of sanity, making sure you've not got these bars too close together. Um, so that's all that's doing there. It also uses the aggregate size as well. It's 20 mil that we put in here to make sure that that's, um, that's working properly. Uh, the next section here basically checks the maximum moment capacity of the beam. So it basically says that um, if you've got if you've got an applied moment bigger than these values here, then the beam won't work at all, and you'll have to actually make the overall dimensions of the beam bigger. Obviously, you can see here we're much less than that, so we can get a beam to work. So section eleven, this is when we start doing the actual calculations, the sort of the proper calculations, checking the capacity of the beam. So this is checking the moments in the beam, checks the moments in the bottom and the top. It also looks at the minimum area of reinforcement that we need um, and makes sure that our reinforcement that we've detailed at the top here um, exceeds the minimum amount or the, re or the required amount. So that's the uh, the check on the on the minimum amount of reinforcement and the already required amount of reinforcement. And then this check here is to make sure that we're not putting too much reinforcement and over reinforcing the beam. Okay, so that's what that's doing. Our next bit is our deflection checks, um, and you can see here this K factor. That's the bit I mentioned before, which is to do with our support conditions. So simply supported gives us a K value of one. The K value is not to be confused with this K factor up here. I have given a formula, so you can kind of tell them apart, but this K factor is different, okay? Um, so don't get that confused with the one down here. The deflection checks basically run through and work out whether our beam is um, gonna work with a sensible deflection um, and checks the span to depth to reinforcement ratio to make sure we've got something sensible. Um, the next check is checking the shear in the beam and making sure that reinforcement, the actual links that we've got are sensible and they're, they're working okay. Um, so the first thing it does is it checks the, the shear strength of the concrete. It then checks the maximum shear capacity of the beam to see if we've actually got a beam which will work for the, the shear force where we can actually detail shear links which will work. In this case, we have. It then goes on to basically work out the uh, capacity of the beam with the shear links and then checks that against the um, applied shear force. And then we've also got to check on the minimum amount of shear reinforcement to make sure that's detailed correctly as well. So that's the shear check. 
Next, we're moving on to the crack ribs, and this is sort of the more, most involved part of the spreadsheet. The first section, 14.1, is all of the constant values that won't change for any part of the crack width design. The first bit is the uh, all these K factors, which are constants. A few of these are uh, to do with what we've put in as inputs above, and a few of these are constant values. So the first two rows are dependent on the type of bars that we've got and the uh, the type of uh, sort of the strains that we're applying. So if, we, if we're doing bending or pure tension, the next two factors are constants from the national annex, the UK national annex. Um, the next bit is to do with geometry, so these are the depths of the reinforcement. You'll notice that this depth of the reinforcement is not the depth from the top of the beam, but from the bottom. So, for example, I'm looking at the depth of the reinforcement and compression, and I'm looking at the bottom steel, if I scroll back up here, that 58 millimeters is the distance from the top of the beam to this top bar here. Okay. Um, in the PDF worked example that I've provided alongside this, I've actually got a diagram which shows that in more, more detail, so you can kind of get your head around how these are defined, these different depths here, and how these areas of reinforcement are also defined. Okay. The next bit is to do with the material properties. So we have the modulus elasticity of concrete in the short term. In this case, that would be the modulus elasticity at 28 days, because I put in 28 days up here. Where was it? Ah, no, it would be the the modulus elasticity at 15 days, I put in 15. So that's what that ECM uh, brackets T is. This is the modulus elasticity at 15 days. This value here, modulus elasticity would creep, that's the long-term modulus elasticity, and that includes that reduction of a third that we talked about before. The next bit here, modular ratio, that's sort of the, the ratio of the modulus elasticity of steel to the modulus elasticity of the concrete in the short and the long-term. Okay, and then we just have the bar diameter as well, which is a user input. So that's all of the user input, all of the constants for the crack widths. The next section we're looking at is the uh, the uncracked section of sex, section assessment without the creep and with the creep. So that's short term, that's long term. You will notice that the formulas here for the depth to the neutral axis and the uncracked second moment of area, they're quite complicated and sort of long formulas, but I do give a derivation of these formulas from first principles in the appendix to the um, the PDF worked example. So at the back of that worked example, it works out how these are derived. And they're basically derived from balancing, um, well not balancing moments, but balancing your geometry using the parallel axis theorem and sort of using engineering fundamentals to sort of work out where your neutral axis depth is and what your second moment of area is. So these are sort of derived from that. But you can go and have a look at it yourself to see how these are derived. Um, the next section is similar. The next section looks at the crack section assessment and it looks at um, that in the short term and the long term again. The difference between these two areas here on the spreadsheet, so the one, the uncracked and the cracked, is that different formulas are used here when we're working out our, our, our neutral axis and our uh, second moment of area. The, um, both these formulas make different assumptions about what parts of the um, section are effective, so which parts of the actual concrete beam are helping you in regards to the stiffness. So I believe on in the uncracked section, you assume that the steel in the top and bottom is effective, whereas when you're looking at the cracked section, you're looking at some of the steel being ineffective or some of the concrete being ineffective. I can't remember exactly how, how that works. I'd recommend again looking to the appendices in the PDF works example, which accompanies this spreadsheet for a bit more information, because I provide some more notes there for you. So that's what this is all doing. This whole section sort of works out your neutral axis, your second moment of area, and then once you've got that, you can use the engineer's bending equation, which is this section here, to work out your stress in the concrete. And then once you've worked out the stress in the concrete, you can use the modular ratio to work out your stress in the steel, which gives you that. And then the stress in the steel is used with the equations in the Euro code um, to work out what your uh, maximum crack spacing is. So the whole neutral axis depth and second moment of area calculations are just a means to an end in order to get the stress in the steel. And once you have this magic value, it lets you then work out these formulas which are given in the Euro code to work out this maximum crack spacing. So that's what this section is doing. And that's basically a repeat for the uncracked section with creep, sorry, the uncracked section without creep, uncracked section with creep, the crack section without creep, and the crack section with creep. So this whole section here is basically, they're all doing the same thing, but you've just got a different equation in each one for the long and short term and for the, for the, um, uh, the neutral axis depth. Okay, so that deals with your maximum crack spacing. Once you have that, you can then look at your actual crack width itself. 
And so these formulas down the bottom here, these are ones all from the, uh, the Euro code. Um, you also use the engineer's bending equation again um, to work out what your uh, cracking moment is. The cracking moment affects whether or not you need to look at, um, it basically affects how you calculate your final crack, crack width down the bottom. So I recommend again going through the PDF worked example to sort of see how this is working. You'll notice again that as well that this mean tensile strength of reinforcement, this is this gets varied depending on whether you're looking at the short term or long term. So you'll see that in the short term loading, we have this formula here which looks at um, how this is reduced based on the number of days. You can see T in, appears in this formula here. So it reduces the, um, the mean tensile strength of the concrete um, because we're looking at the short term. So this would be the, the mean tensile strength at 15 days, whereas the value down the bottom here, when we're looking at the long term, is looking at the um, concrete strength at 28 days. So that's going to be stronger. 2.77 is clearly stronger than 2.5. Okay, so that's what that's doing there. But again, these two sections here are basically doing the same thing with very slight adjustments to work out what your crack width is. Okay, and then the last bit here, once you've got your crack width, it compares the crack width to the actual crack width limit that we've got, which was 0.3. And you can see that we're we're nowhere near that. We're doing fine on the crack width. Okay, um, so that deals with all that. The last section here is basically just working out your minimum area of tensile reinforcement to control the cracking. So this is sort of a minimum amount um, which is sensible to have to control the cracking. And I believe this is a very similar formula, or it might be even identical to the one which is done when we look at our bending check right at the beginning here in, in section uh, section 11. I think it's very similar to this formula for the AS min. Uh, but it's done again just to just to make sure so it's sort of coming out from a different direction so that deals with that the last section is torsion and um, the torsion checks again are quite involved the torsion checks account for the shear in both the major and minor axis um, and they also sort of look at the i believe the tensile reinforcement as well and they sort of tell you whether you need to provide additional bars i should mention as well that when you've got torsion on the beam and it's a significant part of the design you should be providing closed links and what I mean by that is if you go back up to the top here and we look at this, this big square link that comes around the outside of the beam, normally this link would be um, just sort of one straight bit of metal which is bent into a square and then it's sort of lapped over itself. When you're doing torsion, you should really be thinking about welding that together so you've got like a, you know, a, a solid rectangular piece of metal um, so you can provide the actual shear flow to get the torsion strength. Um, it's just good practice when you've got a high uh, torsional force in the beam. Um, so that sort of deals with all of our design section. Uh, if you go to the bottom here, you can see our diagram for the, the torsion. The torsion will also show the actual effective areas for the torsion, so the, like the wall thicknesses that it's using for its design. Obviously, I've not got any torsional forces in here, so it's not plotting that, um, but that's also quite useful as a sanity check to see how that's working. And then down the bottom here, we have a design summary, which sort of obviously checks everything that's going on. You can see we've got green appearing everywhere, so we're all okay. Anything that is showing up in red is a failure. Anything that's showing up in yellow is a warning. You can basically ignore the yellow warnings, but the red ones will, you know, you really shouldn't be ignoring. You should, you should fix them if they appear. Um, the spreadsheet does allow you to save the designs if you've got warnings or errors. So if, if you've got yellow or red cells, but again, if those appear, you should really be checking to make sure, you know, the spreadsheet is doing what you want and you've not got problems. Okay, so that's the whole design sheet. Uh, now it's time to show, show you how to actually save this into our database so we can design multiple sections and get multiple beams designed. So once we've got our design sorted and we're happy with it, we can save all of this input data, all of these yellow cells, out to our save design sheet down the bottom here. Okay, so you can see this, uh, this is empty at the moment. If I want to append our design onto this table in here, what I can do is I can go over here on the right-hand side of the spreadsheet, I put a zero in this design number box, and then click Save Design to Database. If I click that and then go to Save Designs, you can see it's exported all of my data into this sheet here for safekeeping. And I can load this data back into my design. If I go up to here and I select Design, so it was Design Number One. You can see Design Number One, see, in this box here. Click One, and I can then load this back into the design sheet. So that will load all the data back in. So we can move our data to and from our Save Design Sheets if I want to save another design and append it onto the table, put in zero again into here and click save design and it will append it to the table. So now we've got two designs in here and you can see design number two. I could load number, number two back in, load that back in. See it's loaded design number two into here and we could just carry on going like that. We can also overwrite if we want. So if I now want to overwrite design one, 
I wanted to give it, say, a funny name, funny name, for example. If I click Save Design, it's going to warn me if this may already exist in the database. Do I want to overwrite? I'm going to hit Yes. If I go to my Save Designs, you can see that it's overwritten that data in there. So it's basically putting that design over the one I had originally. So that's how we sort of move stuff to and from the database. We can also rearrange the stuff in this database as well. So if I had, um, let's say, Design 1 and Design 2 in here, I could rearrange the rows in this in this uh, sheet. If I basically pick the row I want to rearrange, so I want to move row two, so design number two, put in two in this box up here, and I can move it up, I can move it down, I can move it to the end. In here, it's going to it's already at the bottom of the table, so it's just telling me that. Move it to the start, move it to the end. So I can actually rearrange the rows in this table um, if I want to. I can also create a summary table. So if I click summary table on here, it's going to basically run through all of these designs design all of them for me, and then put out the pertinent design information to a summary sheet down here. So I to click that, create summary table, it's basically run through all those designs, and you can see here, I've got a sort of a summary of all of my inputted data. If I scroll to the right, I've also got a summary of all my utilizations, you know, if things are failing or not. Again, obviously it's passing. This is a really good way of basically working out, you know, doing a batch process on all of your concrete beam designs. If you've got like hundreds of them or whatever, you can, you know, put a bunch of data into this sheet, click summary table and it will, it will tell you everything you need to know in terms of what things are failing and what things aren't and of course I can go back to here I can clear the table I can update the table I can print the table if I have to print it will tell me where I want to print it um, if I'm worried about how my print scaling is working I can scroll all the way to the right I can set my print scaling onto that so it's at 70% it's going to print at 70% it will automatically print all the pages for you and everything that you want to do I can also do a similar thing on my design sheet I can print this sheet, PDF current design, it will print the current design sheet. And again, I can set the scaling down here, the print scaling. Um, I can also quite usefully generate an AutoCAD plot as well. So if I just open up AutoCAD, open it up, I'm gonna run it in the background. If I just click this button, what it's gonna do, it's gonna create a bunch of geometry and I save it to the clipboard. And then if I go into the command line in AutoCAD and hit Control V, it's gonna plot all of that in AutoCAD for me. So hopefully when that loads, that will do that. I'm gonna go, I'll come back to that in a minute. If we go to Save Designs over here, there's some more stuff you can do as well. So in Save Designs, you've also got a Create Summary Table for the rebar estimating. So what it's gonna do, it's gonna run through all of these designs again, but instead of actually designing them and you know designing all of our utilities, it's just gonna dump all of the reinforcement information into this rebar estimating sheet down here. So I just do that quickly. Create rebar, Create Summary Table for the rebar estimating. It's going to come with this, this box here. It says, do you want to use the lengths of the beams used for the, for the beam design within the rebar estimation summary? If I hit yes, it's going to populate these values in yellow in here with the, with the beam lengths that I've done. The reason I've done this is because sometimes you'll have a beam length um, when, you're, when you're doing your L over D span over uh, D deflection check. That will be, you'll put in a length for that, but your actual beam would be longer. So for example, let's say I'm designing a cantilever. I've got this cantilever here, like that, and I want to design my L over D check. Let's say that's a meter, but this backspan is like two meters. Well, I want to use one meter for my cantilever for my my L over D check for my deflection. But when I'm doing my like the mass of all of my reinforcement and all of my D, you know, working out an estimation of how much reinforcing steel I've got, well, I want to use the whole length of the beam for that, right? I want to use three meters. So that's why I've set the spreadsheet up in this way. You can either use the one meter, the 1000, which is also populated from our design, or we can basically manually put this in, in here. So that would be free, for example, okay? And then what this sheet is all doing, all of the rest of this stuff is auto calculated. So it works out the mass of all of your bottom, top, side, still. It works out the mass of all the links. What it doesn't do is work out the mass of any kind of um, um, U-bars that you've got in the beam but it does work out the mass of all of the laps. So if I go back to my design here, if I do a new design, I'm gonna draw a beam on plan. So let's say we have a beam on plan like that. And we have a beam which is say 10 meters long. I have some rebar in here. I've got say a bar like that, and I'll have a bar like that. Obviously we need to lap these, we've got these two bars which are lapping. It will calculate this lap length in here where the two bars lap over and it will work out the total mass of the steel in the beam accounting for these laps because obviously we've got more steel occurring here. 
And the way that it calculates these laps is that if you go back to the spreadsheet, you can see here it works out the maximum length of the of the rebar that we can we can put. So it, it, it limits that based on either the max handling weight. So we can set that to the max handling weight, the length of the actual bar itself, or, or both. So for example, if I picked both weight and length, I can put in here the maximum safe lifting weight is generally 20 kilograms. That's a single person lift. So we can limit the length of our of one bar, one reinforcement bar, to 20 kilograms or eight meters. Or I can I can change that obviously, I could make it less if I wanted to. So at the moment now, because I've selected both weight and length, the spreadsheet is limiting the maximum length of my bar, my re one reinforcing bar, to being either 20 kilograms, and it will back work out the length that, that provides a, a bar with a weight of 20 kilograms, or eight meters, okay? So let's just assume we're using something like an H10, like a really lightweight bar. Clearly in that case, we're gonna be limited by the eight meter length. It's gonna say, right, the longest reinforcing bar I can have is eight meters, so if I go back to this plan drawing here, it's going to say, right, well, I can only get a bar which is eight meters long. So I'll, my bar would be something like this in red. We'll go like that. So I'll get one bar in at eight meters long, like that. That would be my eight meters. And then I need to have another bar somewhere in here, say like that, for example. And then I'll have a lap length there. So it basically works out how many bars you'd need, you know, with all the laps and everything in that beam. Um, to actually detail it for you. So it's, it's done all that for you. And it also works out the lap length here. The lap length here is uh, limited, you can set that. So you, here it's limited to 40 times the bar diameter. So if I go back to my spreadsheet, this distance here, shown in blue, if this was an H10 bar, and I'd set the, uh, the limit as 40 times, then this distance is gonna be 40, 400, or, for, sorry, 40 times 10. Okay, so that's what that's doing there for the lap length. Okay, so let's clear that. Go back to here. And then this last bit is to do with the concrete cover. Um, and so this is basically looking at, if we go back to our beam one plan again, our concrete cover is gonna be at the end here. That will be our, our cover that we have to deal with. Cover like that. And our bar will sit in here like that so it won't go beyond the cover so the, that cover distance there is to limit the length of your bar again so once you've got all those in there it will basically auto calculate all of these all of these weights of the steel and it gives you a total mass of rebar over here if you want uh, I, if i update my designs i can click update summary and click no on that it will update all of that um, i can also clear all the information in here when i click clear it's not going to clear these values in, in yellow because these values in yellow could have been manually added by the user, and so we don't want to lose them if we if we click clear necessarily. So I, when you click that one, it won't won't automatically clear everything in these yellow cells. Would it if I click this one up here, clear all information from the table, it will clear these yellow cells. Okay, so just be careful when you're using which button you're using. You should generally be using this button to clear stuff. If you have accidentally cleared clicked on clear all information from the table, so if I click on that one and click yes and it deletes these ones and I've gone, oh no, I've deleted these, I've lost my data. I'm gonna to have to manually add them all back in again. Don't worry, because if you click on help over here and go, generally speaking, there'll be a backup data that will, that will allow you to save them. In this case, it hasn't worked because I've not had enough chance to save the data over here. But generally speaking, that may be a get, get out of jail card for you. And then finally, we can, do, we can print the summary table and we can set the printing scaling for the summary table over here as well. Okay, so that sort of deals with the rebar estimating spreadsheet. And again, this doesn't deal with any kind of U-bars, U-bar closes that we have at the end of the beams. And it doesn't deal with any kind of chairs or spaces that we've got, okay? So you should account for that when you're doing your, your estimation of the, of the concrete. I'm gonna quickly show you the, uh, the AutoCAD plot. So if I go back to my design sheet here and click on auto, uh, generate AutoCAD plot, it's gonna copy that to the clipboard. Then if I go to AutoCAD, let's start a drawing and go to the command line and hit control V. It's gonna plot my beam for me, okay? So we've got a nice beam plotted exactly to scale, ready to go, we can drop this into our, our drawing package and get everything detailed up. And even better than that as well, if we want to plot multiple ones, if we go to our save design sheet over here and we go plot all designs in AutoCAD, it's gonna do it for all the beams. Control V, 
So it's plotted both those designs over here for you. So you don't have to go manually design by design and export. You can do them all in one hit. And by the way, it will do top down. So that's, that's the first design, that's the second design, and so on, okay? It's done top, top to the bottom, okay? Same way as the rows are organized in the spreadsheet. So back to here. Um, the last thing to really mention is I can delete designs from the sheet. So I can delete the current design, select design one, delete the current design. See, it's gonna delete that. And delete all the designs if I want. And I can also reset the row coloring. So if I've changed a bunch of colors in here, because I'm trying to like aid myself and see what, seeing what's going on in this table, I can reset the row coloring. So it's gonna reset that back to gray and white, which is the, the default, okay? Uh, and that's pretty much the spreadsheet. That's that's everything that uh, is going on with this one. Um, I hope this was useful and sort of gave you a good overview of what's going on. Uh, and again, I recommend going through the, the worked example and sort of having a look at that as well. Um, there's bookmarks all the way through it, PDF bookmarks to aid with navigation. Um, and I've also included a printout of the spreadsheet as well at the end, which sort of shows, which sits back to back with the actual manually done calculations to sort of show that they, they align with the spreadsheet. Okay. I uh, hope this helps and uh, I'll catch you in the next one. Bye-bye.